Hey guys, welcome back to the Final Phase Podcast. We've been away for a few weeks, but we're coming back with a few episodes lined up. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into the creation esports scene with one of my friends that lives and breeds local esports. I feel like this is something that might interest a lot of people outside of our region because you can find similar stories within your country, especially if your esports scene is on the smaller side. But let's talk about all kinds of interesting details and struggles in our local esports. All right, guys, here we go. Level is here. Uh, one of my uh, longtime friends from the g- local gaming community has been around since, well, who knows how long? 15 years now, is it? Uh, yeah, half yeah. my life, almost. So welcome to the Final Phase podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, a little bit sick, but it's okay. How yeah. are you? It's winter. Doing well, too. A little bit sick, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us about yourself. Uh, my name is Luca. I go by the handle Level or Levels. Yeah, I'm 28 years old. Years old. I'm living in Velika Gorica, near Zagreb, Croatia, uh, and I'm working as a social media executive for A1 Asia League and uh, esports journalist for Index Higher, the biggest online uh, media or second biggest in Croatia. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's about it. The rest will come along the way later. Yeah, so what about your road into gaming and then into esports? Uh, what did you start with? I started playing Call of Duty 1, uh, but it was like a really late back then, around 2005, I believe, 2006. I transitioned to Call of Duty 4, and when I realized that I'm never going to be good enough to be a professional player or something, I started working uh, within the Call of Duty community. Back then it was Call of Duty HR and uh, Gamerjack. And around that time, there was a League of Legends beta, I believe. And then I made the final transition to the League of Legends. Mm-hmm. And ever since, I've been working in on different esports projects, uh, Croatia in the region, and so on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you recently, well, a few years ago, you became a, uh, an esports journalist, something that didn't even exist in Croatia, basically. So let's say you were one of the first actual... Uh, esport full-time journalists uh, for a local uh, news portal so how did you even come to that idea to apply for such a position did it even exist before you applied for it or what did you apply for (laughs) it was kind of funny story i was working as a journalist or news writer for uh, gamer hair which is a community gaming portal call it like that uh and uh when that project stopped uh I saw an article about uh, Nikola Niko Kovac uh, transferring from Mouseports to FaZe. And the index wrote some bullshit uh, article that was full of uh, false information. So I contacted the owner, uh, Matija Babic, whom I didn't know back then. So it was just like Facebook message. And he said, OK, you should talk to editor. And then I talked to the Aredzic, who is editor of sports section at Index. and they and they said that they are planning to get more involved into esports, and I got the job. <laughs> I believe I, I was the first esports journalist. Uh, I believe I'm still the only one in Croatia. But yeah, uh, well, I guess more and more people start doing this now since uh, you've been pushing the the way uh, for everyone else. But I mean, we're gonna talk about local esports more. Um, so, did you ever have any? Uh, aspirations to go international when it comes to journalism, like our friend uh, Profa, who went to work for HLTV? Um, Not really, because I believe that the knowledge of the regional and local scene is one of my fortes, so uh, I never wanted to do anything like this uh, internationally. I Mm -hmm. had some offers from Cybersport and stuff like that, but most offers I got were actually from betting companies that were trying to develop the some kind of a betting esports product. Mm-hmm. Uh, for journalism, not so much. Yeah, I see. Okay, so tell us a little about a little bit. What <clears throat> can So tell us a little bit about the current state of local esports. Local meaning, you know, Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia. What tournaments are there? What um, organizers are there? And uh, what do you think of all of that? So there are two big leagues going on in the region. 
Uh, one is the EBL, the other one A1 Asia League, and recently started uh, Relog Media League. And I don't know what's league officially called, but those were the two or three that are uh, currently the biggest and I believe the most important. There are several big tournaments, but mostly organized uh, within the the uh, fairs like Gamescon in Serbia or uh, Reboot Infogamer in Zagreb. Uh, mostly by, I don't know, Clan Rur uh, or the same people that they're doing stuff. So you have the several game, gaming communities uh, within the region, like uh, PUBG Balkan League, uh, I don't know, Counter-Strike Adria, um, Rainbow Six Siege Adria and uh, Rocket League. Uh, and people are doing some kind of community term- tournaments or, let's say, yeah, well, there they are community tournaments, although prize pools can be like five or ten thousand. Uh, my opinion about the current state is is developing, but we are always like making one step forward, two steps back, because when you have new people entering the scene, uh, new communities, they are making the same mistakes we did like ten years ago when we were doing projects like uh, Game Eject Winter Challenge or Game Eject Bunny Challenge, and the times are totally different. But uh, I believe that in time there will be enough people who know what they're doing to push the scene uh, uh, further and to develop it even more. Mm -hmm. But uh, what do these uh, big tournaments like A1 Adria League and EBL mean for the development of the scene? Like, what do they do better than, I don't know, tournaments that like five or ten years ago that we had here? So the... There is, uh, they're providing professional environment for uh, not just for players and teams to develop and to get some professional experience, but also for the people working on the project. So you you can't have like a stage manager or stage host who never uh, uh, never worked on esports tournament or esports stage like in that capacity. You know, mm-hmm. uh, so they're not just important for the. To, to give the players opportunity to compete, to get some experience and to uh, advance to, the, to, to bigger competitions, but also for the people that are working and learning on the project. Yeah. Like, I don't know, from... <coughs> sorry, totally different for an admin to, to change PC on a stage or to change PC uh, if there is no audience, no stage, you know, you're just like, oh, sorry, bro, we got to switch your PC like we did back in 2009. Yeah. So what you're trying to say is uh, these tournaments are more important for the background staff than for the actual players because the players can kind of get their experience in all kinds of different tournaments and in the EU and stuff. But our local guys that work in the back, like the admins, the the tech guys, they don't get to have any kind of like real experience in Croatia because there's no big tournaments. Uh, I believe that is... Yeah, but I believe it's equally important for the players, like for the people behind this. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of the players won't get the... Some of the players that played on the EBL or uh, the A1 Adria League uh, will probably never get the chance to play on a bigger tournament or bigger stage. But the ones who do get that opportunity, they will have some experience to, to lean back on and say, OK, I know I've been here, I've, I've done that. It's the same stage as in Belgrade or in Zagreb. Mm-hmm. Which is really important when it comes to the, you know, pressure and, and how, do, how, how are you handling Yeah, I guess a lot of the local players play in local teams and local teams in general don't really do that well on the European scene. So they don't really get to play these lands outside that much. I mean, I guess most people go to lands like, um, I don't know, some in Slovenia, some in Serbia and in Croatia. And that's about it for 99% of the competitive players in Croatia and the region. Yeah, but you have, I talked to Sakre recently, who is playing for the SK Gaming in the League of Legends European Championship. Uh, he went two times on the European Masters, second biggest League of Legends tournament in Europe. And he said that it meant a lot to him to have that, that stage experience from the, the regional competitions and uh, from from European Masters itself. He went there twice. Mm-hmm. So the the that's that's what matters we are those leagues are here to provide the professional environment for players and for the people behind the scene so uh the the way that 
before we didn't have it. You know, there were, weren't no esports stages, uh, big video walls, and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, so, what could these tournament organizers do better, specifically Asia League and EBL? Um, well, it's kind of hard for me to say because I'm <laughs> working uh, working on the project. But uh, let's put it like this: uh, it's a learning process. So we are expecting uh, for something to happen really fast, really soon, and to blow up and to be like uh, I am Katowice. I know. Uh, I'm I've been in esports for long enough. So I, re I remember what first international looked like. I remember how, how uh, I don't know, season two world championship in League of Legends looked like. Uh, I know what, what his, well, DreamHack also had its up and downs. Even recently, when with the launch of the Blast Pro series, they were like late for two whole days or something like that. Uh, esports, we have the, the, the experience and, and knowledge from the people who did this before us, but we also have new challenges that we didn't have before. So it's a learning process, and uh, esports is uh, uh, really, really, uh, it's a different company, uh, it's a different industry, and uh, you can't really learn anything uh, from, I don't know, the only, the only way you can learn is to try and do something and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Because nobody is going to tell you, okay, uh, there's so many little things that goes into these these projects that are uh, that are so much different from everything else people have done before. Uh, I believe that both both leagues are doing well and improving uh, year by year. That's mm -hmm. the important thing. Uh, I believe that they should put. Uh, more focus on working with the teams and players uh, to to follow this, the, their footsteps to make it more um, to make them more present on the on the scene to make it more uh, marketable uh, to to develop to help them grow mm -hmm. uh, because you are dependent on them right yeah so is this the first time that we have such a huge sponsor to come into the sports scene the local sports scene as in uh... A1, which is one of the biggest telecoms in the region? Uh, I believe so. A1 is mostly involved in, I don't know, every single or every bigger gaming project one way or another. Mm -hmm. So they are really, really pushing and growing the, the, the whole gaming and esports scene, mm -hmm. well, at least for the past couple of years. All right. So let's go back and... Uh look into the past of uh, Croatian esports and Croatian esports achievements. Um, what are some notable Croatian esports players that come to your mind? Well, first is 4K Zeus, the, the Worker 3 player, although that was, let's say, before my time. Mm -hmm. Tak, the StarCraft player, the guy who almost beat Koreans in national wars and stuff like that. Um, there were several people player playing. Uh, we even had uh, uh, this girl, I believe it was Kitara, if I'm not wrong, uh, that competed like in 1999 QuakeCon or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> it was ridiculous. Uh, well, and for the we had another Sebastian mm -hmm. Wallen, the the World of Warcraft player. Most people don't know about him, but I believe that he was second at BlizzCon in 2012. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Played for SK Gaming. Uh, and for the last couple of years, we have uh, Sakre, Tony Sabalic, uh, Perks, and Limit. All of them are League of Legends players, pros. Mm -hmm. uh, Leon, Nelo, Pesic, uh, the Rainbow Six Siege player currently playing for Navi and having great results. There were even some guys winning... Uh, some big smite competition, I believe. Mm -hmm. But it's it's smite, come on. <laughs> you you can't follow it all, right? We even had some crossfire pl players, but I, yeah, I never really yeah, 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 uh, the, the, yeah. I know, I know, but I'm not gonna mention the name. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's interesting that we had so many different players in different games. But uh, if you don't look up at esports earnings or whatever, you don't get to know these people like it's like they never existed because where are you going to read about them right 
Where are you gonna? Yeah. Take you? But it was it's it was different time back then and now. Even uh, Pex, who is the most uh, successful uh, Western League of Legends player, is not ranked highly in the esports earning. Right, yeah. because the system, because of the way the League of Legends is perceived. Of works. course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, is there a lack of player talent or marketability these days when it comes to creation players? Because we don't have that many players currently, um, compared to you know the global number of professional players. We only have you know a few League of Legends players. Now, recently, we got a Rainbow Six player, recently got this guy, you know. What do you think is the main problem for player development in uh, the local scene? Well, the scene is not developed, so there is no uh, way to develop players. They all made it by themselves. Nobody helped them. Nobody mm -hmm. uh, pushed them. Like uh, Sacre and Limit, for example, had some experiences from EBL and the A1 Adria League, but that's all. It's not like someone is going to push you to the LEC. Uh, the other big thing is when you don't have a player in the professional esports, like the Serbian players, let's say, for example, do in in uh, in Nico, in uh, Janko, YNK, uh, and even in Agile TV, there is nobody who's gonna like uh, give you give you that final push to to make it to the European scene. Since Perks became the the player in European LCS now LEC. Uh, in next two years, we got two more. Well, we are. I guess we are going to have the third creation uh, in the LEC soon. So, well, if you think about it, that that's the league consisted of 10 teams, each five players. We have three of them, almost whole team. Mm -hmm. Like there are also three Slovenians and one Serbian player. So it's like more than 10% from, from, a, from, a, from a region, right? Yeah, but but that's one game that was like extremely popular, by far the most popular in Croatia for a long time. So, I guess that worked out for uh, League of Legends in the end. But what about other games like Counter Strike? What happened there with the Croatian scene? Croatian scene, I believe, it <laughs> does not really exist in CS:GO right now. Well, there are several players, but they started mixing. The good players started playing with uh, the players from other regions other nationalities and uh, mm. other countries because they were good enough uh and they kind of left the 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 croatian scene but the the serbian serbia had uh, always been better they always had one top notch team like crazy right now back then well it was the same team just under the different names mm -hmm. we never had that kind of a success in 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 csgo uh but the, the region is small, especially Croatia itself, so you can't expect uh, people to... It's even harder to, to make it uh, in, the, in the less known games, you know? Yeah. Because there you, you, you're practically playing by yourself, you are coming from a small community, uh, and, and even smaller community and stuff like that. It's like, mm -hmm. let's say, how many people in Croatia play Overwatch? I believe it's a couple of thousand. Yeah. So to to have a, a really good Overwatch player, there really is really low chance. So how many professional orgs or teams do we have currently in Croatia? Uh, none, I believe. <laughs> there were some. <laughs> it sounds really it sounds really bad, but it's true. Uh, well, uh, I I'm sorry if I left out anyone, but I believe there are no a professional org in terms that is paying their players uh, have like a content crew behind them and stuff like that. For me, it was really shocking to see when I was in Athens for the LEC finals that the Fnatic team came with more content guys than players. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like seven of them recording, writing, I don't know what they're doing, but that's that's the, the that's something that Croatian and <clears throat> regional orgs never never really understood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, when you think back, like there's not much content around the players. They're, they're just players and that's it like there's yeah, we come but, back to the marketability thing but uh, that's not necessarily the player's fault it's like the whole system is i i they don't uh, the players don't understand their role in it uh it's not so if you're really 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 fucking good you don't have to care about social media if you're not you must 
So, yeah. and they never understood that, and the uh, team orgs owners uh, never did, never really explained them. But when we had ClickTech, ClickTech had some notable results even on the European scene with their League of Legends team. Uh, they they had like uh, this this guy Maleski Tapir who is um, uh, YouTuber like recording FIFA videos and stuff like that. He was with hundred thousand subscribers. He was much more marketable than best League of Legends team in the region uh, since ever. Like yeah yeah. So it's that that that's the difference. So it's hard for people to explain when you're a creation org and you're talking to the local companies like. Uh, so we have this team and they are playing in a European Master. European Master is really good, like 15,000, 20,000 people watch this play. Yeah, but I don't really care about European Masters. I don't know what League of Legends is. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't care for that international market. Uh, what do you have in Croatia? Well, there are no tournaments in Croatia, so not much, right? And it's a difference different when you come and say okay we have this guy he's playing fifa and 100,000 people follow him. like everybody know everybody knows about fifa it's basically football uh, everybody knows about youtube and we all know that influencers and youtubers are now a real thing yeah yeah for sure i mean there is not that many players that also stream or even if they do like it's you know 10 20 viewers 30 whatever, and it's not really something that would uh, catch someone's eye when it comes to sponsoring certain things or, or a team. So that's definitely something people should work on. It's it's not easy, though. Like, how do you work on it? That's also another topic. Like, it's, what what uh, do you have to do to, to make... It's like learning and developing, you know? Uh, everybody started streaming for 10 or 20 people, yeah. right? Well, yeah. you, know, you know better than most. But uh, there is something that that player have to understand that it's part of their job. Mm. For me, when I when I talk to the owner of of Clicktech, he said I can't really make <clears throat> my players stream because type of contracts we have doesn't doesn't allow me that. And also, mm. they are playing like ten or twelve hours a day. They are not all outgoing extroverted person. Yeah. You know, it's not. Yeah easy for them to to uh, to stream or to talk to the audience uh, to uh, handle the toxicity of twitch chat and stuff like that but it's you have to understand that if this is this is going to be what are you doing and you are making a living off you have to do it yeah like the tsm did the great job imagine i believe that all players that played for tsm uh, in league of legends are now big streamers yeah they are so how how did they do it like Dyrus doesn't seem like, I don't know, extroverted, easygoing person. He's sleeping on the stream most of the time, but people still watch him. So that's the, that's, that's the example that it can be done. Yeah, of course. Of course, it's hard, right? Yes, but um, it is also additionally hard in our region because getting the numbers that someone like Dyrus can get is much, much harder. But then again, you don't need such big numbers to make a, a difference when it comes to marketability uh but yeah i guess that's a topic for for another podcast because but like, yeah i know but if you have like 50 100 viewers times five players a team yeah. they can each cover one day you have the content for the whole week and stuff like that well it's numbers right yeah do you think that uh, it's easy to get numbers or um page views for esports articles in Croatia. The thing that any number getting in Croatia is <laughs> is easy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, true. True. Uh, but uh, what happened to these... Uh, you mentioned ClickTech. Uh, there's a uh, Locustic. What happened to these orgs that were here a uh, few years back? Uh, I don't know. They they just didn't find, find it. I believe that ClickTech even didn't lose money on it but it was just too much work for that kind of return because it's like meetings 24 7 for you know it's not enough to make a living for yourself and for the team you can't well they 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 they're they're getting paid but not you you can't match what international orgs are are uh, offering their players uh so it's really hard to compete with them and kind of your cluster you are uh, choking your players or 
not letting them develop, you know. You can't keep them here, but you won't get any money from their transfers because you don't have that type of contracts because that type of contracts are not yet developed in Croatia and stuff like that. So it's mm -hmm. like it's whole infrastructure or thing and problem, not just not just what happened to the orgs or why they are not they don't exist anymore. Locasti here, their esports venture, I believe they are happy with it, but it was I don't know. I had the feeling that it was just like let's say a venture, so not gonna last or not not something mm -hmm. that they they have their core business and it's not obviously esports. Yeah. But they made they made an impact and people know about them and they did a re really good job and it helped to build an image of, of that company. Mm -hmm. What about uh, Go Crazy? They're also a Croatian based yeah. or they at least were. I don't even know anymore, but they were also a similar story like uh, Locustic. To a degree, um, yes, but they uh, it was much bigger investment, mm -hmm. so it's much more riskier. And of course, um, when Valians signed Binary Dragons, they were already a team that were trying to break into top 20, top 30 in the world. Uh, I believe that they made some necessary changes with the rebranding into Crazy. I have my own opinion about it. But they also uh, managed to to market their own players, like Hunter, who was mm -hmm. really good for a really long time. But uh, one, once people saw him playing on the major and in big tournaments and doing really well, he was like, okay, also helped that he's cousin of Nico, right? Uh, and the I still believe that Antonio Mage, the owner, said himself that it's not marketable or profitable to have the, the top 20 CSGO team because nobody cares about top 20, you know? Esports is the, the kind of industry that you just have to win things, yeah. right? If you, you stop winning, you just fall off. Uh, and it happens all the time. Uh, let's say you, you remember the hype when uh, FaZe created this super team around Nico, and... They're not getting results. I, I don't know. I haven't seen a tweet from, from Nico. Like, I don't know. I haven't seen any real content about it. They are like top six in the world, but they are not winning, right? They have like these teams, like, I don't know, Sharks, uh, Renegades, 100 teams that are always like somewhere somewhere near the, the top, but how do they make money? I don't really know. <laughs> but That's what I was about to ask. Like, how do these teams that are always around, like, that like North Renegades, uh, the Russian teams. How how do they make a living then? You have the the a different type of orgs, right? FaZe can push uh, their CS:GO team as long as they can. So can G2 Esports because they have the, the success on other platforms yeah. on other on other esports. Go crazy! It's just go crazy. Even the North is connected to the football club Copenhagen, so they're not yeah. like. Uh, ran out of money and they are investing long term and they don't really care about initiative initial return but the the crazy is self financed or financed from the investors they don't have this social big social media presence they started working on it lately and they're doing a much better job but it will as i said before it will to you need time to build something and and to to create something you know Fanatic wasn't built overnight or even wasn't phased. None of these big orgs started just like this and, I don't know, had like 5 million followers and success in, in 10 different games. Yeah. So let's uh, stray away from uh, the actual orgs and esports a little bit and let's talk about the parental mindset when it comes to uh, their kids playing professionally in Croatia. Is it different from other countries? What do you think? I believe no. Uh, well, let's say it depends which country are you comparing Croatia to, right? Uh, I believe that is different in Denmark, but most of the things are different in Denmark than in Croatia, right? So is the parental parental mentality. Um, there are two. As millennials grow up and have their own kids, they are pushing and they are not. Uh, uh, they don't they don't mind if their kids uh, want to be pro players or streamers because it's something we are used to, right? We know about it. It's not we we grew up on it. Uh, for us, it's normal. So you have this this old attitude, like 
uh, you're not going to play video games for the whole day. I don't fucking care how good you are or what you're going to do. Uh, and it's, it's a waste of time. And you have this other type, like when parents are really supportive and even help and push their kids to, to explain them like, okay, so if you're going to be a pro player, you have to play eight hours a day. You have to train, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to finish school stuff like that so these are my terms are you going to do it it's not it's same like any sport or i don't know uh for example uh nix who was really good croatian csgo player and really young uh he had support from his father his father came to the tournaments uh talk with us he understood the game well enough so he can uh, understand what's happening and if he made a mistake or not uh, i was even contacted by the 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 father of a young Fortnite player, Exus, uh, to like when he qualified for Star Ladder or something like that, his father is also really supportive. Like, my kid is doing well. Can we do anything about it? What do you think should be done next? So I believe that the this will going to happen even more in the future because, as I said, video games are normal for us. Like, I don't know. I don't remember my life without playing video games. Right. Yeah, but what do you think of, I don't know, when someone's like 15 and uh, gets a chance to play for some, I don't know, tier 3 team in League of Legends? What do you think parents are going to say when he comes and says, hey, I need to quit school to join this team? What do you think happens then? Well, uh, probably, I even, even if it's not my kid, I would tell it not to do it because I understand that playing for tier 3 team is not enough to to make a push for you can you can uh, develop and inspire along the high school so it's not like you have to make that decision right then mm -hmm. there is no reason for you not to finish high school it's only <clears throat> there are only like once in a lifetime opportunity like signing directly for the lcs teams or lec teams and stuff like that but you can well, it's it's Croatia and it's high school in Croatia. Come on, you can do it without even going there, right? So it's True. just you 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 just have to come sometimes and write some messages and say like, okay, I'm a professional player. Or even if your parents understand, they can they they can say to the teachers, right? He's not yeah. going to come yeah. to school when he has big tournaments and so on. But I even I think that even in high school, and teachers are younger and and think differently about these things, right? It's it's a valid career choice, not for many, not for most, but it is, right? Yeah. So they the teachers should treat it like a sport because they're pretty tolerant when it comes to someone doing sports, right? If if you're yeah, missing course. out on school because of some big I don't know football tournament, they're not going to say anything. So I guess it's all about the the whole community how they treat it. But okay, I guess it's slowly developing in Croatia for sure. Um. What is the main obstacle for uh, getting more money involved in uh, local esports from your view and your experience? It's that companies don't have the way to work with the community. Right? So communities, companies don't work with the, with, the, with the person. They work with other companies or other legal objects or how do you call them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the key to developing esports anywhere is developing communities. You get everything from a community. You get future fans, you get uh, players, you get teams, and you get people who are going to to, to do these tournaments or tournament organizing. Uh, the other thing is that people in Croatia are told lies about esports. They are shown images from uh, big esports tournaments that are never going to happen in Croatia. And uh, they they invest, get disappointed, and then are are not easily convinced anymore to invest in, in esports. But the, on the other hand, the gaming is big buzz and big thing. And I believe that you have to find a way for something like, you know, I believe that esports itself isn't enough. Mm -hmm. When you put it as a part of something, as a, that it's, it's much better, it gives it much better look. Because if you've ever been to uh, an esports tournament, uh, people don't understand that it's really exhausting watching 12 hours of Dota, right? Yeah. You're sitting in this hall, drinking, uh, I don't know, Coke or water or beer, eating hot dogs and like watching 12 hours of Dota with pauses. And it's not really that attractive. 
right? But if you put it, if you if you put some kind of a show, if you have uh, some kind of activities around the tournament, uh, then you can get money, you can get people satisfied. You have to offer much more than just the just the games of Dota. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I get it. But uh, what do you think would be the few right moves when it comes to developing local esports? What would you like to see in local esports happening to make it better? I would like to see communities getting together to form some kind of um, some kind of I don't know association that will represent them and their interests uh, mm-hmm. towards the 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 uh, government locally or even on on on, uh, on even lower level. Um, I would like to see uh, these communities to form also some kind of for e- each one of them or something like that, like a company or uh, some kind of legal uh, legal representative that so they can work with the companies. Uh, I'd like to see uh, people uh, actually validating the the quality and the good work and products because we have this mentality, right? When you do something wrong or you fucked up something, they're all over like uh, all over Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, bad comments, shit talking and stuff like that. But when you do something good, they like send you a DM, right? A really good job. That's exactly what I was thinking. Why don't you say it? Why don't you say it publicly? Like, show it, share it. That's the point, you know? Yeah. For uh, Let me give you an example. So I've been doing, uh, I started writing for the Index Expert Tweet Professor, but uh, he wrote two two articles, and then uh, we understand understood that he can't work for Agile TV and Index at the same time. Mm-hmm. So uh, he stopped, but he still didn't like Index Expert page on Facebook. It's been three years, almost three years. You see what I mean? Like, <laughs> I get it. I mean, okay, but so you have to. <clears throat> if I think that you're making good content, I'm gonna sub. I'm gonna give you. Uh, I'm gonna donate you five dollars, and that's my way of supporting you and helping you develop. It's something like uh, if you see a good content, it doesn't have to be streaming, or if you see a good team. Or do you think that somebody somebody is go, doing well? Click it, like it, share it. Tell other people like this is this is good stuff. We should support this. And tell other when when something is wrong, that's bullshit. We're not going to support this. But it's not it's not working like that. You know, it's because we have this kind of mentality that we hate everybody and everyone, and uh, it doesn't matter how successful am I as long as I'm more successful than you. All right, so tell me about interviewing Perks. He's our most famous player, and you're basically the only guy in Croatia that gets to interview him, right? Yes, it and was really, it was really hard, right? To so, get to Perks. Yeah. So, how did that look? Getting to him, then doing interviews with him. The thing is that he did an interview for other media, like in 2016, I believe, and he was really disappointed how it turned out. It was like classical clickbait bullshit. Uh, and uh, he didn't give interviews. He didn't do it in Croatian, but he also he had the need to do something because he understand that there is a place for him in Croatian esports and that he he is the one of key components in developing and uh, bringing esports in Croatia to more people, right? Uh, there was something going on, like a meetup in Zagreb, and I... Uh, talked to to one of the click tech players brought him to zagreb and that was the connection i sat down to him with him and i asked are, are, could we do an interview like i also said you're gonna get the 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 text before it's published uh i really understand league of legends i know who you are what you've been doing for the past several years so it was like uh getting to know each other process but ever since we've been doing like one or two interviews a year uh, he has a really tight schedule, so when he comes to Zagreb, we 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 talk. I respect his time. I respect his opinions uh, because I understand that I don't know he lost uh, finals of the World Championship. I congratulated him on the result, and I he told me in an interview a couple of months ago that he he is going to take a break, right? Because you know it's a been it's been a long season. Uh, so I didn't bother him to get an interview or even a statement because I understand that he's emotionally drained. You know, he just wants a break 
right? Uh, after a couple of weeks, I said that uh, I would like to talk to him before the new year. Whenever he's ready, he said, yeah, I'm on a break. I'll get back to you uh, when I get back in my right in my routine and it's that's it i believe that i don't know is 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 it his decision to only give me interviews but i'm the only one doing them for the for the past two years mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um do you in general have issues when you're reaching out to people for interviews does everyone say yes there's people say no and how does it look well people mostly say yes well it's different if you are working with players that players uh, or some have, some of them have agents so you have to go through them uh, but mostly they say yes the only thing that I never managed to to get is Niko Kovac mm. uh, I don't know why I wrote to phase I even asked uh, Profa to to literally ask him at the event like yo Niko can you answer an email or something like that but they mostly say yes uh, there's a couple of interviews I'd like to do, uh, but are put on hold because of some 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 things on my work. Uh, one of them is Lacoste, the, mm-hmm. the Dota 2 analyst and caster, because he has totally different perspective of the whole esports scene and the uh, and the big big tournaments. Uh, but yeah, people mostly say yes because, well, most of them know me, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not like I've been I've been working just for index for three years so people uh, read my read what i wrote they maybe not don't agree with everything i i say or write but they know that i support i understand the scene uh what are they doing and that uh, i have the good intentions to to you know if i write an interview about you you're not going to get a bunch of money and ten thousand euros but for when someone starts uh starts researching who you are what you're doing it helps that information is given in the Croatian language right then on the on the relevant media. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you're attending a LAN tournament next week, as well as myself. Uh the good game PUBG LAN. What are your expectations of that tournament? Uh I'm not really sure because there is some personal stuff on the thirteenth, I believe, uh that we should travel thirteenth afternoon. But mm-hmm. uh, I'll try to make it. Well <laughs> I'm not really fond of PUBG, right? <laughs> which is which is which is kind of weird because I I I watch some streamers uh, play it, but I never got hooked to the, to that game. I expect uh, good execution and good a good tournament. Uh, I don't know. I'm not that well well. Uh, I don't know many PUBG players. I know a couple of the notable ones. Uh, I also understand that some of guys who played Call of Duty 4 are now really good in PUBG. Yeah. Uh, it it should be fun, but, you know, it's never going to be for me. So if we are talking just strictly about the tournament, I expect it to be a really good show. Uh, I know Nikola for a, for a long time. I know that uh, what he's doing and in what way. So that everything should be should be done properly players should have fun and even the location is kind of like exotic let's say it like that uh it should be fun but for me it's never gonna be like you know those those tournaments you went uh, well we went to hang out for with people from yeah, the whole course. region you didn't go to play even we paid like uh 500 kunas uh, as a team to compete uh, on a tournament we are never going to win just to beat I don't know some people or just to talk to some friends we are talking to or playing against on the servers and yeah stuff for like sure that. i mean i think a lot of people coming there also are coming in with the same mentality to uh you know they just want to play against someone or just be in that land because that means something there's not that many PUBG lands in croatia and the ones that were there i mean the biggest one was also held by the same organizers so it's not like anyone is doing any and uh, yeah, sure, it's a PUBG land, but still, you get to see a lot of people that you haven't seen in years and, and all that. So why not? It's it's fun. I I always wanted to create something like Home Story Cup. I really enjoy enjoy that format. You know? Yeah. That would be awesome. Like playing in the house, just chilling, talking, not formality. For me, that's kind of a of of uh, my vision or my feeling about this. You know? Ah, those big lights, those shows is it's more for the general public, not yeah. for us. 
Well, that's a project that is uh, <laughs> years away, I'd say. <laughs> so what about your future goals? I don't know. My, my, well, it's, I'll continue working on the regional, domestic, local esports scene. Uh, I'm finally have enough time since the season four of AI, A1 Adria League has finished. I have enough time to get back to CS Adria, the project I always loved worked on because I always loved working on because it's great people doing great stuff with, uh, I don't know, uh, with the big heart. Uh, I believe there are room for some improvements and that we are going to do some crazy shit in the next year. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, bringing esports to as many uh, browsers as possible in any right. kind of way. Uh, last but not least, what is your vision of Croatian esports in like five to ten years? Uh, uh, it's. Uh, <laughs> I believe that we'll have a couple of leagues that are integrated in the global esports system mm -hmm. uh who is who is going to do that i'm not really sure but i know that uh, riot games have uh, for example uh, idea to develop national leagues similar on the way that uh, uefa does for mm -hmm. champions league right um i believe that we have even more players because there was this article on bbc that really stuck to me when we made it to the finals of the world cup in football uh, someone wrote uh, Croatian, Croatians Masters of Chaos, like we are doing something out of nothing and then we can adapt to the different environments really good because <laughs> you came out of nowhere so you can take anything from me. Uh, there is, we have talents, players and I think that we'll made an even bigger impact on the, on the that Croatian people will make in 10 years, even bigger impact in the global global esports companies than domestic, mm -hmm. because there are really there are really people here that know what they're doing. They're really good at their job, and I, if they're given the right opportunity, they could do some amazing stuff. Yeah, I agree with that. All right, that's it for today. Thank you for the great interview. Uh, I think this is a great episode, and a lot of people like it. Uh, I think that even the people that are not from the region are going to enjoy it. We did do it in English, but it, the point is to get the our local esports out there and let people know how we're doing and what we're struggling with. And I think the people are going to find that interesting. Thank you, man. Thank you for that. All right, guys, that's it. Thank you for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I think it's interesting to hear about smaller communities and how they develop. And we're going to have more guests from the same community talking about different topics in the future. So yeah, stay tuned, subscribe to the podcast, and I'll see you in the next one.